This is a quick case study of Bargain Basement Bathyspheres maps, specifically how we were able to get these meandering paths uh, on these maps uh, set up in a way that was easy to modify uh, and easy to update uh, as changes came in from development, um, and also just so that we could have an easier time making new maps in the future. As you can see, there's a lot of spaces. This is actually only half of, of one map. Uh, there's three maps in total, and they all have a lot of spaces in them. So uh, the obvious way to do this would have been to just make uh, individual rectangles, um, make them individual uh, files, uh, say like one gray, gray square or gray rectangle, um, and then just link it in InDesign um, and just copy that link multiple times. Um, and then do the same for every instance of any other type of space. Um, just if you have a, a green space, for example, or an orange space, you just make those in Illustrator, have those in a linked folder, um, and, and drop them into this InDesign file and just manually adjust things. However, uh, what you don't get in doing that is a very smooth curve around every little um, bend on the path here, uh, the way that you get um, on some of these examples. Um, and what I really want to do was uh, make this a little bit easier than that, um, so that in, in the very in the, in the circumstance that we would need to modify this or update it, that it would be easier to do so. Um, so our uh, one of our designers um, on the team came up with a clever solution, and together we kind of cooperated and uh, made this uh, interesting system that uh, I think will be useful for you if you need to make a similar type of game board. Um, and uh, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on this. So let's take a look at this uh, as a much more simple example. Uh, in this example, I've stripped out everything in the background, all the graphics and everything, um, all the background art. So really, we're just focusing on the pads here. Uh, and you'll have to forgive me a little bit because my machine's chugging a, a bit as I work on this. Um, this this is one of the downsides of using this method. It, it does uh, eat up a, a, a couple of different functions in, in, in design that uh, you might not have much experience with, but um, I, I promise you this is actually a, a very good solution for, for this particular challenge. Uh, so um, the main thing I want to point out is that uh, these lines that you see here, and I'll zoom in a little bit closer, uh, this line that you see in the background is actually a text path. Um, and by that I mean I've used the uh, type on path tool that's over here on the far left side. You can also activate it by hitting shift T uh, and that will turn any vector path that you have selected into a baseline path that, that text will flow onto. Normally you would see this on something where you'd want to type in into a circle or into a gentle curve. Um, in this case, uh, we're not really using that for type. Um, so I could technically type this here. So you know, type, 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 type. Um, I'm not using it for, for actual text, though you can see the, uh, the, the space characters that I have inserted with these. Um, uh, these are indicated by the blue dots. I have hidden characters uh, visible here, so you can actually see some characters that would actually normally be hidden uh, to the naked eye. Um, but uh, So the reason I'm using text on uh, type on path here uh, is so that I can just make these uh, individual spaces anchored objects rather than um, having them rest independent of the path. Uh, these are actually on the on the path that I that I have here. And you can see this if I start typing stuff, the spaces will move to accommodate the extra space that I'm adding to that uh, to that line. Um, and the reason I set things up uh, this way uh, is a few reasons. One, uh, it makes it very easy for me to um, select all on a single path, and I'll, I'll zoom out a bit just so you can see what this looks like. I'm zooming out, and I'm selecting everything that's on this path here. You can see this, uh, all the black sections are what I've highlighted by just hitting uh, select all. And if I wanted to, uh, I could adjust the, uh, the, the spacing on this with the uh, tracking function here. Um, and I can say I want some extra, extra tracking, um, and that will move some objects around uh, along the path. If you look very closely at the very bottom of this path, I am starting to get some overset characters. So if I push this too far, then I'm going to lose a space off the edge. And you can see that here. I've just lost that space that's on the very far end. But uh, this is a very simple way for me to adjust the spacing of an entire path without having to manually adjust every single one of these individual anchored objects. 
um, which would be a, a huge pain in the butt to, to deal with um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, some extra fun things that you can do with this method. Let me uh, undo a bunch of this stuff that I've just been messing with. Undo, undo, undo. Okay, so I've undone all that. Uh, some, here are some extra fun things that you can do. Uh, if you need to individually adjust the spacing uh, between, two, uh, between two objects, you can just type in your, in your space bar and start adding some extra room there if necessary. So on a, on a few uh, individual circumstances, I've, I've done that. I should probably do that here on this path, um, actually, uh, where these uh, two spaces are intersecting with each other. Uh, this is where I would normally probably add an extra bit of space so that they don't overlap each other too much. Uh, but this is also another example of where I would uh, have an advantage here over individually placing every single every single little object because under norm normal circumstances, if I were to just drop these individual objects, I would have to get the curves, uh, the, the rotations here just exactly right to have this smooth flow uh, around that bend. But uh, instead, what I've got is uh, just a bunch of a bunch of characters essentially that are flowing as if they were normal text and they just follow whatever that baseline tells them to flow around. Sometimes it's a little unpredictable, but on the whole, it's very handy and, and very easy uh, for me to to work with a path like this rather than having to control for every every little degree of rotation that may occur around a bend. Um, and of course, in some cases, the path is pretty straight, so it makes it uh, much easier there too, since I can just straighten out that line and um, and control how that works. So let's show you an extreme example of how this would work. Um, say I have this curve and I don't want it to be that straight. I want it to bend a bit. I've selected the, uh, the um, point at the very end of this path, and I am going to select one of the handles here that you can see extending from that point that controls the curve. So I'm spinning it out a little bit and you can see that the blue line is uh, starting to bend here and once it catches up it'll you'll see how this renders all together. Let's bend this further and bend this even more and you have to be careful here because at the very end I do have a couple of things uh, in very close proximity to each other. And I have to be very careful that I'm selecting the correct point here. So I'm going to be very careful there. Okay, so I've selected that point and I'm going to move that around a bit. And as I say, this is this does make InDesign chug a bit. So if your machine starts getting a bit slow as you start doing this method, that's, that's totally normal. Um, my machine's rather old, so uh, it, it's, uh, it might be a bit more sluggish than yours. But in the end, I think this still saves some time because otherwise I'd happen to be uh, individually move and rotate every one of these uh, spaces. But now I can just arbitrarily move the path as I wish, um, and then all of these spaces will just follow that curve. The one thing you have to be careful of, uh, as always, uh, is making sure you don't get overset text as you start manipulating your path. Uh, one way to control this, um, if you if you make your path longer than it was originally, uh, the end of the typable area, the, the right margin of this, uh, will only stay where it was originally relative to the length of the path. So you do have to extend that all the way out as far as you as far as you want to um, in order to accommodate the extra room you have available. Uh, so I still need to extend this even further but the path has uh, been shortened a bit because of its curve. So I'm going to extend that out even more and move that right margin a little bit more. And now I have all of the content available here. Um, and, and of course, with different curves, you're going to have a slightly different spacing between, uh, between elements. So in this case, I don't need these extra little white spaces that I had between uh, these rectangles. So it's actually much more even here. Um, and if I want to adjust the, the spacing of the entire path, as I mentioned before, I can just control the tracking, uh, just nudging it up and down a little bit as I wish. And uh, no matter where it is, it just follows that baseline. So uh, one last thing that I think is useful about this, I can control um, the object style 
on the on these on the path that's behind the objects um, by uh, just using object styles here I've got a few set up that have different uh, line styles so I'm going to uh, I'm selecting the the path itself and I'm going to choose a couple of these object styles just to show you how they change so top of the list is just a blue guideline and all I've changed here uh, in this object style is that the path uh, is a little bit thinner and it has a different shade of blue. Um, but I can also use the InDesign uh, stroke styles to do dashes, or uh, for example, um, changing the caps to rounded caps. Um, I can change this to a different color if I wish, um, or I can just keep this solid uh, as I wish. And that is, uh, that is not going to affect the uh, foreground elements, so to speak, the, the, uh, the actual anchored objects. Uh, so you can move these arbitrarily as, as you wish um, without having to uh, worry about this affecting the object styles. Those are kind of independent of each other. Um, now, that said, um, I've, I've shown before in a previous tutorial that when you're working in object styles, you have a lot of fine control that uh, you might not be uh, messing with too much. Um, so specifically, um, if you look under this drop-down menu, you'll see that uh, there are individual effects for the stroke, for the fill, and for text. So uh, if you have an effect that applies to only the text, that is going to uh, be separate from the stroke. So uh, let's do this one by one. Uh, so uh, my stroke doesn't have any effects on it right now, but say I want to do a drop shadow on it for whatever reason, um, I am going to select the uh, check mark there. Uh, and I can control the effects of that uh, drop shadow. So let's say I want it to be 100% opacity. Um, I don't want any distance on it. I, I want it to be uh, perfectly aligned with that layer. Again, I have just to wait a little bit for uh, design to catch up here. I'm moving things quite a bit. So now I have this drop shadow, say I set it to 50% and I want it to be a bit bigger. So I'm just gonna make it five millimeters. Just, just really big for, for the scale of this thing. And I want this to be very obvious uh, as a demonstration. Uh, so you can see that I have a drop shadow behind the stroke, but you'll note that that drop shadow doesn't, uh, doesn't work around every single little anchored object here. The, those are those are not shadowed. If I wanted to shadow those with the stroke, then I would have just uh, used this drop down menu to just select the entire object and apply a drop shadow to that instead. Uh, but I have different plans. So I want to go to text. And I'm really straining <laughs> in design here. So say I turn on drop shadow on the text. Let's see what this does. Ah, so you can see, let me turn off the distance. And let me turn on the, uh, actually increase the opacity to 100% again. And I'm in fact going to change the color of this so that it's even more clear where the drop shadow of the text uh, lays versus the drop shadow of the stroke. So I'm making the drop shadow on the text red. Let's call this two millimeters. And make that noise, oh, sorry, make that spread 50%. And that's good, okay. So now I've changed the object style for, for, this, for this path uh, so that any of the text has a red drop shadow that is overset on top of the path the path itself also has its own drop shadow that is underneath all of the objects that are aligned to that path. Um, 
this doesn't look very good, mind you, but I wanted to show you an example of just how powerful this method could be um, and how flexible it allows you to be as you're working on your own uh, uh, on your own board design. Um, the big uh, big showstopper here being, of course, that now uh, because I've modified that object style, it's applied that to the entire document. All of these had the same object styles um, assigned to them. So once I've changed that object style, the effect um, the effects that I've uh, requested of that object style are now being applied to everywhere. And I only had it to modify one setting or two, a couple of settings in the background to change the entire board design. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very powerful, makes the machine a little bit sluggish as a result, but uh, overall, I think this is a great solution for, uh, for this uh, particular challenge that you might run into. So uh, until next time, hope this has been useful and I'll talk to you later. Bye.